Well, good morning again, and welcome to church again. Thank you, Pastor Todd. Welcome to all of you here in the sanctuary, and welcome to you guys out there in YouTube land. Glad that you could join us this morning. We're going to skip ahead to chapter 5 of Matthew real quick, and there Jesus said, You are the light of the world. You know Jesus, and He lives inside of you from the moment you were saved. You got His light. And you remember the little song, This is a little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Today we're going to sing the modern version of that, and praise God, with a song that's called Wildfire. So, if you would stand with me, please. Let's go to the Lord and worship Him. Let's just forget about the week and everything that's happened. Just concentrate on Jesus Christ, your Savior, and be thankful. Still, we're in this season of Thanksgiving. Be thankful for everything that Jesus has done for us, especially going to the cross and dying. And now that He lives again, that light in us, let's let it shine today as we sing and worship Him. He loves that when we do that. Let's pray real quick. Father, we just thank You for this day. We thank You for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank You for salvation and an eternal home in heaven for those of us who choose to believe. Help us be shining lights in this world that others, our family members and our friends that don't know You yet, Lord, will see that light and burn in us. So we pray today, Lord, that You will burn in us brightly. Burn through this day and burn through this night with Your holy light through us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Set my heart on fire 
give the Lord a hand. I'm surrounded 
Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. We come to the time in the season when family and friends get a need to offer a prayer of thanksgiving for blessings we've known through the years to join hands and thank the creator now when thanksgiving is due and this year when i count my blessings i'm thanking the lord he made you this year when i count my blessings i'm thanking the lord he made you i'm grateful for the laughter of children the sun and the wind and the rain the color of blue in your sweet eyes the sight of a high ball and train the the prairie and old oh, love that you've made new this year when I count my blessings I'm thinking the Lord he made you this year when I count my blessings I'm thinking the Lord he made you okay and welcome to church again Give the Lord a hand, everybody. Woo. Happy to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? Amen? Okay, so here I am at the pulpit. What do I always do? Right? I usually ask who read their chapter, but just to include everyone, because there's people here who weren't here last week. If you read your Bibles this week at all, raise your hand. Amen. Look at that. Hallelujah. There you go. But we didn't get all hands again. Here comes my spiel. You cheated yourself. If you didn't raise your hand, you cheated yourself. And you got no one to blame but yourself. It wasn't because God didn't get you a Bible available to read. Right? And Even if you couldn't read, it wasn't because you couldn't read. It's because you could play these things on uh, Gateway Bible. Or BibleGateway.com has an audio section. That's free. Just go on that. Don't miss out on it again. Next week, we will be in John chapter 11. But this week was Matthew chapter 4, and I hope you read that if you knew. Today I start a, a set of sermons uh, leading into Christmas that I'm going to call Portraits of Jesus. So, uh, just like you and I, we don't always look the same in every picture that has ever been taken of us, right? How many, how many love all the pictures of themselves they've ever seen? Raise your hand. No? We have no photogenic reel? Okay. Get out your driver's license and let's take a look. <laughs> so I thought I might get a hand to go up and then I was going to challenge him with the driver's license test, but it didn't work. But So, you know, if we look close at, in the Bible, there are unique portraits of Jesus that are painted throughout the Bible. Definitely in the Gospels. So, you know, people hang a picture of Jesus on the wall, you know, as if they had cameras 2,000 years ago, Right? But that's not the only portrait of Jesus. You ever look through the family photo albums and you see all the pictures of people in different situations? And there, There's a whole portrait album of our Lord and Savior documented in the Bible. So, including today, we just have four Sundays before Christmas. Did I get a yay or a... Uh, okay. Some yes, we got the younger ones looking forward to Christmas. <laughs> Maybe the parents haven't done all the shopping yet. I don't. Uh, four Sundays, so Thanksgiving is behind us, and now we head down the slippery slope, full speed. It's like going down the down the snow sl sled with grease on it. We're heading to Christmas. Who knows how fast this goes, right? How fast before Christmas is here? We're heading full speed. So it's my hope and prayer that we can slow down some. Just slow down a little bit, right? 
even if it's just for a short time each day and reflect on the gift that was given to mankind. That's what Christmas is about, right? It's not about the presence that we give people. We're trying to somewhat emulate how giving God was when we get, buy gifts for people, and that's okay. But the real gift was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the greatest gift ever given. If you know that's true, say amen. 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 So, title of the sermon is just simply going to be Portrait, Portraits of Jesus. We're going to be in uh, Matthew chapter 4. Um, and this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He was just baptized in chapter 3, if you're familiar with the Gospel of Matthew. And probably the account of Christ's temptation is most likely very familiar to all of us. Right? We got the COVID no kids in the nursery going on. That's okay. <laughs> That's my granddaughter, but we'll keep her wrangled in. She's trying to steal the show here. Right? But Jesus is, is the real star here. Uh, this account of Christ's temptations you can read about in Luke chapter 4. You can read about it in Mark chapter 1. I like the, what's documented here in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, and what we're going to look at and see, can we see a portrait of Jesus? Maybe one that we haven't thought about before. There might be a few of them here that we pick up on. I think we can if we look. So if you would, just bow your heads with me and let us pray. And then we'll get right into the word of God. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for a time and place to gather and to look into your word, to worship you, to praise you, to grow closer to you through the study of your word, Father. And right now, anoint my lips to preach your message. Give us all ears to hear with and a heart to receive with. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So here we got Matthew chapter 4. Uh, let me set the stage for us, all right? I thought maybe I'd get the handheld microphone, but I don't want to go grab it. I'd play Bruce Buffer, right? Let's get ready to rumble! Right? If, you've, if anyone knows MMA or have watched any boxing matches, but I don't want to make light of it. Uh, the stakes are pretty high here, you know? This, I'll set the stage. Satan takes advantage of an opportunity. Does that sound like the devil? takes advantage of an opportunity. And we give him opportunities all the time. So he takes advantage of this opportunity when Jesus is weak in his humanity, in his flesh. We'll look at that here in a second. The stakes couldn't be higher. The destiny of creation is at stake. So it's, uh, it's not just a football game. It's not just a boxing match. This was big time. A big time event here. So let's look here. Chap chapter 4, Matthew, verse 1. It says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So here we have the players, right? And right now I just want you to stop. Stop for a second. Say this with me. This was for me. This was for me. Right? This, this wasn't any test that Jesus had to pass. This, this whole thing is for you. Think, think of that as we go. God already knows every outcome. Do you know that? So how could Jesus take a test if God already knows every outcome? We don't know every outcome. We don't know the outcome of the tests that we take. So this test is for us. It's for us to look at, know about. He did it for us, right? And, I, and I'd also like to say that the first Adam failed his tempting. If you've read the account in Genesis of Adam and Eve, you know that they failed. They fell in the garden. The first Adam failed, right? And now Jesus, the last Adam, Paul calls him, will prevail. We're going to read that. So a little reading assignment for later today is maybe you think about this. And I hope, I hope through, as you go through Sunday and maybe through your week, you kind of ponder the, chap, the portion of scripture that we read on Sunday. But later today, as you think about this, read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul does a pretty good job of documenting the first Adam, the last Adam, what all this means for our, our salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, later today. Do yourself a favor. Okay, verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. You suppose he was? Has anyone ever fasted? Raise their hand. 
Okay. Has anyone ever fasted 40 days? Not, not, no, no hands. Okay. Uh, are you hungry when you fast? Yes. 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 I get a lot of yeses. Yes. Yes. It's been proven many times that humans can fast 40 days. It can happen. I'm not telling you to do that. Don't go try it. But it can happen. It has been done. It has been documented. We're not reading some fairy tale here. This is real. This is reality. It can happen. Moses and Elijah both fasted 40 days. And that's a little Bible trivia. You can try and find those portions of Scripture today if you really want to dig in. Where, is, where does it document Moses fasted 40 days? Where does it document Elijah fasted 40 days? They did. And Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And the law and prophets both point towards Jesus. And then here Jesus is. He's going to fast for 40 days, right? And then what I, I don't want you to miss here is what it said there at the end. He was afterward hungry. He was hungry. So just because he was God, right? Just because you thought Jesus could do everything, doesn't mean this didn't take a toll on him. A 40-day fast, let me tell you what, will take a toll on a human body. Christ was in a human body. This took a toll on him. Matthew put that in there so we would know. This wasn't easy peasy. This wasn't a walk in the park. It took a toll on him. It was hard. He was hungry. Right? So if we, if we look here, there's a portrait of Jesus here. You see the portrait of a frail body, of a weak human See that portrait of Jesus that we don't often look at. Forty days without food. And he was hungry. He was weak. His body was frail at this point. And, you know, he'll need tending to and we'll get to that. So, portrait of Jesus right there. Verse 3. And when the tempter came to him. <laughs> who likes that line? I feel like you rotten. <laughs> you know what I mean? You opportunistic. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Oh man, would that sound good. How about some bread after you've fasted 40 days? Ooh, I can feel my stomach churning right now. I bet his stomach just went, <laughs> you know. I mean, and what does the Bible say about the devil? More subtle than all the other creatures, right? It's what it says in Genesis. Subtly comes in here and says, hey, if, if you're the Son of God, and you know, how about that for subtlety? The first thing he does is question Christ's identity. If, right? And he's not doing that to, uh, because he doesn't know who Christ is. Well, the devil knows who he is. And I'm sure he knows Christ knows who he is, but it's a sidetrack. It's a smokescreen. Maybe I can provoke him if I question his humanity. He's weak already, if you're the Son of God. How, when we're provoked, how many good decisions do we make? There the devil, knowing humans, knowing the human body, comes at him with a little, let's just see if we can provoke him first with a smoke screen, if you're the son of God. And then he gets to the, the desirous part, turn these stones into bread. He says, feed yourself. Stop this nonsense. Right? If you're the creator, create something to eat. It all sounds reasonable. Amen? And if you're hungry, it sounds real reasonable. Oh yeah, baby. Give me the bread. Quite attempting. I mean, he's, he's, he's not playing games. He, he's on a mission. Uh, verse 4. But Jesus answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He quotes scripture. Man, I might be hungry, but I got food you can't see. Isn't that what he's saying? So all these scripture quotes that Jesus is going to quote here come from Deuteronomy, which is interesting because it is Israel's wilderness experience. Deuteronomy documents the wilderness experience of Israel, and here we are with Jesus in the wilderness. And here comes the tempter. It's Jesus' wilderness experience, if you will. This particular quote, if you'd like to look at it at some point, comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. 
And what, what we're gathering here is the Word of God is a more important sustenance than food. Now, how many of us, we, none of us raised our hands that we fasted for 40 days. How many of us are going to leave here from church and not eat? How many are going to leave here from church and not read our Bibles till next Sunday? Jesus just said it's more important than the food you eat. But we're going to go and we're going to eat our food and we're going to put the Bible on the shelf. Probably not take it down until we come to church next Sunday. Woe is me. <laughs> not good. Not a good. Not a good plan. Oh my. How about the plan being, I'm not going to eat till I read my Bible again. Boy, you're going to be some Bible reading people. <laughs> Let me tell you, if we make that agreement, I'm only going to read when, eat when I read a little portion of the Bible. Boy, you guys are going to be some Bible reading people. Next week, everyone's going to have both hands and both feet in the air. When I say, who read their Bibles? Because you're probably eating three times a day. I mean, come on. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good. So he says, I got food you can't see, right? It's more important than the food you're trying to make me turn to bread here. And we all know what just happens to the food we eat, right? Do we really have to talk about it? We go to the bathroom and it happens. That's what becomes of the food. The Word of God has an eternal blessing. It lives forever in you. You see? Oh, hopefully the point's made. Verse 5. So, shot him down. Then the devil take him up into the holy city. We got Jerusalem here. And set, setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Way up high. And this is probably about a 400 foot drop. Who's going to die if they drop 400 feet? Yes. All humans will die. So, according to historical estimates, this was a pinnacle that also was on the side of a hill. It would have been a very, very long drop. Now we know where we're at. Verse 6. And Satan saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, okay. Now we've established who you are, and so if it is really so, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. So now, here he comes, he's going to use scripture. He's like, oh, is this a scripture quoting game? I can play that game too, the devil says. Here, let me give you one of mine. Of course, he, he quotes uh, Psalms 91, verses 11 and 12. He does a good job of twisting their meaning. Of course, would you expect him to do anything else? Did God really say... You can hear his, his sarcasm in all this. He says, uh, why, don't you, why don't you quit this? Just get some instant help from your suffering. Make the angels help you now. You clearly believe in the scriptures. You clearly believe in the word of God. Throw yourself off here. You don't want to perform the miracle and turn the stones into bread. Make God do it. Throw yourself down. God will take care of it. In this, in this suffering now. Rely on the scriptures. What a, what a peace, huh? This is how he works. <laughs> how about, do it now, the faster the better. How much faster could you get than throwing yourself off of a building, 400 foot drop? You're either going to get help instantly, or you're not going to need any help. Because <laughs> it's going to be over. Am I right? So, Let's put an end to it now. And who's not all about ending suffering quickly? I am. Raise your hand if you'd like to end your suffering quickly. Yeah. It's reasonable request. Let's make it quick. I mean, this kind of triggers a little story. And I've got just a little bit of time. You know, I'm a big bad motorcycle rider. We've all seen me ride my Harley up here to church. And, and Bill's out here. He rides Harleys too. And Randy. and Right? Big bad motorcycle rider. Well... When Rachel and I took one of our first road trips, we, uh, we went up, we were going to ride all the way to the peak of, tip of Michigan, right across the bridge, and go up into the UP. we we'll do this on our motorcycle. It was in June. It was about 80 here. We took off. We didn't even have a rain jacket. 
<laughs> Two days later, we're uh, approaching Mackinac City. It's 40 degrees for the high. No sun, and it's raining. And we got like ponchos. <laughs> Whatever we could pick up at the hardware store, and we're riding. 40 degrees for hours. And I'm so cold. It's miserable. I have suffering. You talk about, not like Christ's suffering, I prefer, but here I am, you know. And I wanted to end it pretty quick. I mean, it was so bad at my, my, I wasn't working. My muscles were locked up. I couldn't even work my thumb to get the turn signal. I'm like, Ugh. And I thought, man, I don't know how much longer I can keep this. I think I'm going to wreck. I'm thinking this. Of course, my wife, I didn't tell her. She's on the back. And, I'm, I, and you know what came over me? I thought, well, if I lay this thing down and I wreck, at least the ambulance is going to come and warm me up. <laughs> How's that for ending suffering quick? You know, let's just wreck the bike so the ambulance can come warm me up. So it sounds reasonable what Satan said to Jesus here. Just get it over with now. Throw yourself off the building. Let's see what Jesus says here. Verse 7. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I'm not going to tempt him to save me, throwing me off of a building. I don't need things like that to prove that he's real. Jesus is saying, you don't tempt God with these. That's Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. If you wanted to check that out at some point. Verse 8. So again, the devil's not ready to quit yet. He's got, he's got some more stuff here. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Man. This is the real mind game, huh? So, all the way up where you could see all the kingdoms of the world. This was probably a supernatural occurring thing. I don't think there's a mountain quite high enough to see all these things. And Satan, as the ruler of the world, Paul calls him. Right? And all the people. Satan's ruling it all. He takes him up there and then he plays the ultimate mind game. He says, you can set all these people free from me. He makes him an offer. He says, let me save you some time and effort. You probably know what's facing you. That cross. And you come to save all these people, right? I can save you all that trouble. I'll just turn them all over to you now. He can be yours. You don't even have to do anything. Just worship me. Huh. Well, who, who among us doesn't want to make things easier? Right? Could you turn down an offer like that? Get what you want in an easier way. Right? That's what he's offering him. The reason he came to the earth to save mankind, he's offering to give it to him in an easier way than... God had planned. Could you turn down an offer like that? And there the poor devil is saying, right, all I ever wanted was just a little worship of my own. Is that so bad? All I ever wanted was just a little worship. Just give it to me now and I'll give it all back. Everything Adam relinquished to me in the garden, I'll give it all back to you. Just give me a little worship. It's all I ever wanted. What a mind game. And there Jesus, 40 days hungry. Could end the whole thing right now. Think it wasn't attempting? Huh? Think about it. Think about all the people Jesus could have saved in one second. Well, if it would have went down the way the devil said it was going to go down. Of course, things go down the way God says they're going to go down. The devil will offer you all kinds of nonsense. Empty promises. You want to take them? You're going to find out they're not going to work out the way God said they're going to work out. God says the way things work out. There's a book here that we live by. And the things in this book are true. The devil will come and offer you things that aren't in here. Those offers, they don't hold weight. Right? Right? But as humans, our nature is to excuse away sin. Do you know it's true? If you know it's true, say, oh my. 
Oh my. That's our nature. We like to excuse away sin. The things that we like to do that we know we shouldn't, we'll make an excuse for it. And you know what the best excuse is? If you're going to somehow help somebody else while you're doing that sin. That is a great excuse. Well, I'm only doing it because I'm helping them. I know I shouldn't be doing it, but boy, what a great excuse. And Jesus had that excuse here. Hmm. Verse 10, let's see the answer. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. No way am I going to worship you. You see what I mean? When we fall down and worship someone, what we do is we acknowledge their lordship over us. That's what worship up here when we sing our songs and we, we talk about the 10,000 reasons and all these things. We are acknowledging God's lordship over us. Lord, reign, have your way in me. Burn in me like a wildfire. See? So, Jesus is clearly not going to do that. He clearly asserts his lordship over the old serpent, whose head he will crush, by the way, which was promised in Genesis. Right? He says, get behind me. And then he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 13 and 14 and he kind of paraphrases it, right? But there's a portrait here in this verse. Here we have the, we had the portrait of the frail Jesus who had not eaten in 40 days and was so tempted by these. And now he rises up his, in his spirit and he says, get behind me devil. I'm the Lord. We have a portrait here of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in the spirit the giant of who God is. Verse 11. And what happened? What happens? Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. The devil finally got the point. That's it. We're going to have to play this thing the hard way. I couldn't get him to take the easy way out. So he takes off and the angels come to minister. Now you don't think Jesus was in some desperate position? You, you fast for 40 days and you're probably going to have to go to the hospital. You're going to have to get some medical attention. And Jesus had to get some attention too. And the angels came and ministered to him. And then he would start his ministry if you read on in the chapter. Awesome chapter to read. But there's so many things to glean just from these few short verses here. When you are tempted, did you hear what I said? When you are tempted, not if you are tempted. When you are tempted, and you will be, and it won't be God doing the tempting, okay? We know who the tempter is, we just found out. So when you are tempted, will you have your sword ready? The sword is the word of God. We, we talked about that a couple weeks ago in Ephesians the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Do you know your Bible well enough to resist temptation? And once again, I want you to pay attention to my words. Do you know your Bible well enough? You see, because when the temptation comes, you're going to have to go with what you know and not what you feel. You see what I'm saying? If Jesus would have went with what he felt, he would have made those stones bread in a heartbeat, baby. I could just see a big old loaf of bread with melted butter on top. You know what I'm saying? After I'm that hungry, oh boy, if it was with what I felt, boy, I'm, I'm going to fall for the first one. The devil wouldn't even have had to get tricky with me. You see, if I'm going with what I feel, make those stones bread, you got it. I would have made it sliced bread. I wouldn't even have had to. Have you see what I'm saying? When the tempting comes, you've got to go with what you know. Because what you feel is probably going to mislead you. The devil works in the feelings of the human nature. He has leverage. But when you've got your sword, you can go with what you know. Wait a minute, I know that's wrong. You see what I'm saying? When the tempting comes, you can say, I know that's wrong. I might want to do it. I feel like maybe I should. <laughs> but I know it's wrong. You've got to go with what you know. Let's, uh, 
that's food for thought. Now as we're leading into the Christmas season, can we make it about Jesus? Can we? We can. We can. Can we look for portraits of Jesus as we draw closer to him leading up to this, this fast time we have? We saw some por Who saw some portraits of Jesus today? Raise your hand. There were some portraits in there. You know, the world is already worshiping the creature over the creator. Did you know that? The world is worshiping the creature over the creator. That's what the world's doing. But when we make Christmas about material things and leave Jesus out, are we not worshiping the created over the creator as well? If all Christmas is is a bunch of presents, whether the ones you get or the ones you buy somebody, if that's all it is, you're worshiping the created stuff. See, that's not what Christmas is. It's about Jesus. And you know what Jesus said? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. That's what he said. I didn't say it. If you know Jesus as your personal Savior, you have eternal life. And you should celebrate that. Who knows Jesus as their personal Savior? Give him a hand. Clap. Celebrate it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I got eternal life. I'm going to be in heaven. Right? You celebrate that. That's what we celebrate. Amen. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I just got news for you. You're dead. Right now, you're dead. Spiritually dead. God said it when, to Adam, the day that you do that, you will die. And he did. He spiritually died and it passed on to mankind. And here, here you are. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're dead. And you're going to stay that way. So Christmas really is nothing but a bunch of presents to you if, you don't, if you're not saved. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to stay that way. This could be the first Christmas that you ever really got the meaning of Christmas. This year you can be saved. You can celebrate Christmas in God's family. Amen? It can happen. Jesus Christ is the greatest gift ever imagined. Let alone given. The greatest gift that was ever even imagined was the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to remember that as we head to Christmas. It's going to be fast. So three weeks now after this Sunday, right? It's going fast. Next week we look for portraits of Jesus in John chapter 11. The reading assignment is John chapter 11. Next week I'll be back here with another portrait of Jesus. And I hope you're here with me. Stand if you would. Let us dismiss. I want to thank everybody for their attention. We thank all the children for their excitement. <laughs> we like that. Bow your heads if you would. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. Your word that reveals your truth to us. Your word that helps us grow closer to you. and It, it, it has an eternal benefit to us, Father. Help us to remember that eternal benefit more each day. And then help us to make Christmas about Jesus. As we're heading that way, Father, I pray every spiritual blessing on these people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and give you peace. May He bless you as you go out these doors. May He bless you as you go into where you're going. And in every place that you find yourself, may the Lord make you a blessing to the people you come into contact with while He is blessing you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.